Hello folks, today we're going to be talking about camera calibration, and this will be the subject of Robotic Systems Chapter 22, as well as CVAA Chapter 8.3.1. So the general topic of calibration is trying to determine some sort of accurate mathematical model of certain physical quantities, so that we can map from sensor observations into some sort of understanding of the actual physical world. This is essentially the first step to making robots work at all. It is somewhat of an unsexy process, and a lot of times when I speak to students about calibration, their eyes sort of glaze, glaze over. Uh, but in fact, this is one of the most important topics for di differ differentiating yourself from your competitors. If you have good calibration, then you can do a lot more than if you have a very poor calibration. So the general calibration process is that you have some sort of trusted measurement system, which is known as your ground truth. You will then develop some parametric model that relates these quantities of interest that you care about uh, and observations that you get from your sensors to some of these ground truth quantities. You'll then go through and gather observations and then optimize the quantities of interest, which are the parameters of the model, so that you minimize the error between the predictions and your ground truth. There's a lot of nuances to being able to make this process work reliably. So one uh, question is whether or not we can actually estimate those quantities of interest using the observations that we get and our ground truth. There's also questions about data acquisition. So how reliable are, are the observations that we're getting? Are we covering the whole operating regime of the robot, et cetera? And then finally, there's algorithmic issues about optimization, uh, such as the dimensionality of the optimization problem that we're setting up, the smoothness of that problem, uh, local minima, nuisance parameters, etc. So we'll talk a bit about nuisance parameters in just a bit. So as examples of calibrations that we'll like to perform, especially for cameras, uh, the first one is going to be intrinsic parameter calibration. The intrinsic parameters of a camera include the focal length, field of view, dimensions of pixels. Uh, it may be kind of strange to you to, to think of dimensions as pixel, of pixels, but some pixels are non-square in many image sensors. And there's also radial distortion, which is caused by lensing. Now, the purpose of these intrinsic parameters is to map from image pixels to the model of an idealized pinhole camera, which we talked about last lecture. So oftentimes what we do in order to calibrate these intrinsic parameters is that we wave a few uh, very distinctive patterns in front of the camera, uh, for example, checkerboards, and we use the ground truth that we know the width of the cells of the checkerboards, and the checkerboards uh, are formed at 90 degrees, uh, and so they have, we have a certain number of uh, cells in each checkerboard to determine that, for example, the lines in the checkerboard should be parallel, and that the uh, spacing of these, uh, of these cells in the world space should be a certain distance apart. So uh, another type of calibration for cameras is what's known as extrinsic parameters. So in intrinsic parameters, we didn't think about where the position of the camera was in the world frame or relative to a link of the camera, uh, sorry, a link of the robot, but intrinsic parameters try to determine where on the world, in the world frame or on a robot's link does the camera live. So we want to figure out the origin of the camera's focal point, the viewing direction, the right direction, and the down direction. So essentially a full transform uh, for the extrinsic parameters. So this frame that we're trying to, the reference frame that we're trying to attach this to is wherever the camera is actually attached to. So if you have what's known as an eye in hand design where you have the camera mounted to your robot's link, then, and you can move it around, you're trying to figure out the mapping from the camera coordinates to the robot's link coordinates. You could also have a fixed camera in the world and you want to determine the world coordinates of the camera uh, with respect to some sort of known world coordinate system, such as the base of the robot. So in order to calibrate, we typically have some sort of distinctive patterns, which are also known as fiducials. Uh, for example, checkerboards or uh, QR-style markers. And what we'll want to do is then determine matches of those image features to uh, the positions at which we know that the robot has moved to. And so from this, we can calibrate these transforms. We may also need to 
calibrate the parameters of our robots themselves. So as you know, though, we have these kinematic models of robots which depend on link lengths, joint axes, joint offsets, etc. And especially when you're trying to do very precision operations, the base uh, cal calibration, the factory calibration that comes out of these URDF models uh, will not be exactly correct. And so if you're really trying to get millimeter level accuracy, you'll oftentimes need to recalibrate the kinematic parameters of your robot. Okay, so how do we do this? In the simple case, when we ever, whenever we want to calibrate anything, we have some sort of, let's suppose that we want to directly observe some quantity of interest and we get an observation Y. If X is the known system state of the robot, we're trying to predict Y is equal to F of X where we don't know the function F. So this is a very similar problem to curve fitting. So essentially what we're going to be doing with calibration is we're going to be generating a calibration training set uh, or, or data set uh, of n different observations of paired inputs x and outputs y. And then we want to just recover an approximation to the true underlying function that generates these observations, uh, f hat. So this will hopefully approximate our data set as much as possible. Uh, there's many different ways to generate such a, um, a, an approximation, so we should be able to take for any new x, a novel x, to interpolate and extrapolate between our, our observations to give us a new prediction. Uh, there are also cases in which we may not want to match our observations exactly. We may not want our model to exactly pass through our measurements. Uh, so when we want something like this, where there, we may have, uh, have, have missed one of our observations, well, these come into play when we may have observations that have high levels of noise or also outliers in our observations. So we'll have to think about those when uh, designing our testing procedures. So as a very simple example, if we're trying to uh, calibrate the amount of torque that a motor produces as a function of its speed and the input uh, voltage, uh, we can, for example, very easily tabulate for many different types of speeds and inputs what the ultimate torque is. And so just by gathering several observations and connecting them together, we'll be able to uh, calibrate some of these parameters of how these uh, motors actually behave. Now, in uh, most camera calibration ta uh, tasks, it's not so easy. And so instead, we want to do something known as parametric model fitting. Oftentimes, we care very much about the parameters that define the model that we care about. Uh, so for example, intrinsic parameters, extrinsic parameters, kinematic parameters. In these cases, we have a very good idea of the mathematical relationships governing the parameters of interest, the input system state, and the observations y. So instead of just uh, trying to produce some uh, arbitrary function y is equal to f of x, we have a parametric form in which the y variable depends on x, but it also depends on theta, the parameters. So the way that we write this is that y is equal to f of x and theta. And in this case, we, there's many different types of models that we care about, especially in camera calibration, uh, where theta is, uh, it includes parameters that we actually care about. Another way that you can think about this is that if y is a function of x, y is also parameterized by this choice of theta. So if, for example, the link lengths of, the, uh, of a kinematic model were to change, then the forward kinematics uh, that takes the configuration Q and produces some sort of end effector Cartesian position X will change depending on those link lengths. Okay, so there's many different types of examples of these parametric models. Uh, and for example, uh, simple models could include polynomials where the theta uh, has, it's a vector of different polynomial coefficients that modulate the uh, various polynomial terms of, of x. In multidimensional estimation problems, the theta can define the, uh, for example, if you have an affine transform, if you assume that y is equal to ax plus b, with a and x being constant matrices, the, uh, the, the parameter vector here, theta, is going to consist of all of the entries of the matrix a and the vector b. 
So if you want to think about this as, a, as one vector, it's going to be a stacked vector of all of the columns of A as well as B. If you're thinking about uh, forward kinematics, as I just mentioned before, if Y is a, uh, is a Cartesian position of an end effector and Q is some set of joint angles, then theta could include the link lengths, joint origins, and also joint axes. So given a parametric model, how do we then fit it to data? Suppose that we have a data set D of paired observations x's and y's, and we know which type of parametric model class we are trying to fit. What we'll try to do is minimize some error function over the parameters theta to get an estimated parameter theta hat. By convention, we drop the D in these discussions so that we actually just have an error function E as a function of theta. And we're going to try to set up that E so that it minimizes the, data, the error between the data and predictions that go through our parametric model. So one very common example of this is the sum of squared errors, which is going to take the sum over all data points of the discrepancy between the Y output and the F uh, of X and, and uh, the value theta as well. And then you'll square that error so that this becomes a positive function. It has a minimum when we predict every output exactly. Uh, another uh, very common example is a weighted sum of squares error. This is especially important when you have vector valued observations. Uh, so here y is a vector, f produces a vector valued output. You will oftentimes use a weighting matrix w to produce this uh, Mahalanobis distance between y and f. Uh, for each of your data points i. A very typical choice of weighting is to take into account the measurement noise of each channel. So for example, if you're, uh, if you're measuring both rotation and translational components in your y, then you would measure a certain type of measurement error in your angles and certain measurement error in your units of translation, and then use a weighting to try to put them into a common unitless uh, error scheme. Now, regardless of what type of error model you choose, the general strategy is then to run some sort of numerical optimization to minimize the error over your parameter vector. You oftentimes are not able to achieve exactly zero error. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is in which your model class could be too simplistic and may not be able to capture the phenomenon that actually generate the data that you observe. Another issue is noise in your data set. Now, it may be tempting for you to add more parameters into your model in order to try to explain the data that you observe. Now, this is a big trade-off when trying to develop good calibration models. So, especially when your observations have noise, it may be tempting to build a complex model, but in fact, it may be better to choose a simpler model and avoid getting zero error. You know, the more complex model you pr produce, typically the better error you'll, you'll um, you'll achieve, but in the case of noise, this will cause you to do what's known as overfit to your data. So as an example, if you have this data set like this, where you have one uh, point that seems like uh, somewhat of an outlier, if your model class was very simple, such as a line, uh, you would get this fit over here. If you had something that looks like, for example, a quadratic curve, you could get a fit like this, which seems to fit most of your data well, except for that one outlier. You could also have a higher order polynomial as an example uh, and fit all of them perfectly, uh, but this causes your, your predictions to become more uh, sensitive to that outlier. And you, know, you could also try any other sort of extremely complex model and fit your data perfectly, uh, but perhaps a model like this may not be useful for making, uh, better, uh, uh, making predictions. So this type of problem is known as overfitting. And so depending on the sources of noise in your measurements, you may choose to uh, reduce the model complexity in, at the sacrifice of exactness in minimizing your error function. There are some automated methods for deciding this, which are known as model selection techniques. And we'll get into those in later uh, classes during this course. So this type of curve fitting problem is one that is seen throughout machine learning, statistics, and numerical methods. Now, one of the interesting things about calibration is that oftentimes we have to deal with more complex calibrations than this, where we have what are known as nuisance parameters. So nuisance parameters means that at each data point, 
the ground truth that we know actually depends on some sort of unknown parameter that depends on the data point itself. So for example, we'll see example of, of cases in which the coordinate transform of the fiducial marker is unknown at each data point. Or if you have some sort of calibration rig, you may not have the rigid transforms, the exact rigid transforms between cameras on that rig. So these are known as nuisance parameters, and these actually need to be optimized inside the, uh, the whole minimization along with your parameters of interest theta. You want to optimize simultaneously the z's as well as the thetas. So here's an example. Let's try to do extrinsic calibration with some plane constraints. So let's suppose we have a depth camera. It gives you point clouds of what is being seen. It's mounted on a robot's link. Now, what you can do is move the link to different locations and orientations, just observing that flat plane. And through those observations of the plane, you can actually calibrate the camera to link transform. All right, so we'll be able to use forward kinematics of our of our arm to figure out where that link is. Then off of that link, there's going to be some camera, so it's going to be it's, there's going to be some translation and possible orientation that differs between the camera link and the gripper link. Uh, here, the red is the gripper link, and the blue is the depiction of the camera. So if I were to move the robot's link to several orientations and positions. I will move the camera, and from the camera data, those points, I can, for example, figure out where the plane actually lies. So in this case, the parameter of interest is the camera to link transform, but the plane itself is something that I don't measure exactly. So I can call this a nuisance parameter. It's going to be common through each of my observations. It's going to include the plane normal and the plane offset, which defines a plane equation that is a constraint on my observations of each point. So I can define now a sum of squared errors of the points that I measure to the plane equation without these being known. So if I, if I had a world space point cloud P and a unknown uh, parameter setting, setting Z giving me this plane, then the sum of squared errors between that point cloud and that plane would be given by this lowercase e function here. So to perform calibration, what I would then do is minimize both over the parameters of interest, the camera transform, and the objective function, uh, and the z value, the overall objective function of the multiple uh, point clouds transformed to the world coordinate system, given that certain parameter setting theta and z. Okay, here's another example. So let's suppose that we have a checkerboard and we're trying to perform a camera's intrinsic calibration. The general procedure is that we wave the checkerboard in front of the camera, keeping it inside the camera's uh, field of view, changing its position and orientation. We know the checkerboard's cell size, W, and we've moved it to N poses. Now the nice thing about a checkerboard is that we can measure or print very accurately the, uh, the size of the checkerboard. And so we actually know the checkerboard corners in some sort of local coordinate system, for example, the upper left of the checkerboard, where the, cam the uh, checkerboard corners would be relative to that coordinate system. However, we don't know where that coordinate system is as we've waved the camera around, uh, waved the checkerboard in front of the camera. Now, correspondingly, our observations will give us many uh, images and we can detect using computer vision techniques the corners of these uh, corner these cells of the checkerboard. So we now have these pixel coordinates, uh, PI, uh, PK, uh, which give us the pixels in which these are projecting to, where each of these corners is projecting to. And so the goal will then be to camera uh, to calibrate the camera intrinsic parameters, which contain the focal lengths, the image centers and also radial distortion parameters, which we haven't talked about too much, but there's some general distortion models that can be used. And what we're trying to do is then minimize the difference between the, uh, the, the known uh, 3D positions of these, of these points of the checkerboard and their projection into the image frame along with the distortions. 
Now the tricky thing here is that we don't actually know where these points are in space. So instead what we'll do is include nuisance parameters which are the transforms of the checkerboard in space relative to the camera accordion system. So the overall nuisance parameter vector will include all of the transforms for each image that we take. And then for each image, the sum of squares reprojection error is going to be the difference between the observed corner pixel and the transformed world coordinates of the, of, of the chessboard, given my intrinsic parameters. So this function here, this f, is going to be some sort of distortion of the normal uh, projective camera transform. Now, with this error function defined, we can then minimize over the intrinsic parameters and the nuisance parameters the objective function that sums over all of these sum of squares errors. OK, so this means it's, a, it's an additional complexity to the optimization process, because these nuisance parameters mean that we have to optimize over a much higher dimensional optimization problem. Also, these nuisance parameters may sometimes cause our optimizations to become non-identifiable. So what does that mean? Identifiability means that when we define some calibration procedure, the, unique opti the, the optimum of the error function it will be unique if we have no noise. So the general condition for this is that the Hessian function, the matrix of second derivatives of our error, has full rank. Now, this can also be, uh, you can also reason about identifiability using geometric reasoning. So as an example, let's suppose that we're doing that uh, camera calibration with a plane. If I only had one observation, so imagine that the camera sees this sort of slanted uh, plane in front of it. This set of observations is identical to the set of observations that it would get if, it, if this uh, reference transform were translated, it would also be the same as if this reference transform were rotated, but the plane rotated along with that reference transform. All right, so there's no way to distinguish, given my observations, whether I'm in case A, B, or C in each of these three cases. On the other hand, if I add more observations, so for example, if I have this slightly tilted second transform of my robot's link, I'll get a second view of the camera, uh, of, of the plane, in which the kind of distance is a little bit different from the first set of observations. So if I were to think about that you know, case B here, where I've just, for example, translated the reference transform of that camera, if I were to look at the second camera position, uh, assuming that I had that, that reference transform, what the view of the plane would look like is this offset plane here. So this certainly doesn't have zero error compared to that common plane that should be governing the observations that we get from view one and view two. Same thing for the second case. We, we certainly would not see the same thing in the second case where the camera has been rotated. So now I can distinguish between these cases. So is it enough just to add more observations? Not exactly. So let's suppose that I had this point to plane problem still, and rather than tilting my camera, I just translated my camera in X and Y. So in this case, you know, I always see a plane that's right in front of me. Uh, it's, it's, it's dead on ahead of me. Now, if I were to then translate my reference frame of my camera relative to my link, you know, let's say that I just slid everything over to the side. You know, there's still no way to distinguish between these two cases because these observations here are known as degenerate. So basically, all the observations that I get on the left side, I get on the right side, they're, they would be identically the same in the case of no noise. So I have to be quite careful in terms of how I design my data acquisition procedure to avoid non-identifiability. So just in general, certain non-identifiable non cases include having more variables than observations. This can happen especially when your nuisance parameters start to grow. Um, so we want to actually take care to design the calibration procedure so that we don't introduce too many nuisance variables. We'll also want to avoid degeneracy of observations, meaning that there's more than one explanation 
for those observations in the physical world. And also one very obvious case of redundancy is when the model, when multiple parameters of the model can be replaced by a smaller set of parameters. So for example, if I have some function like uh, f of x theta is equal to theta one x divided by theta two, I could have replaced theta one divided by theta two by a single parameter called theta three. And that just, you know, that drops the number of, um, of, of, um, of parameters, meaning that there's redundancy in the choice of theta one and theta two. This is oftentimes not as obvious as this case. So for example, if I have a parameter vector theta encoding some sort of matrix or some sort of uh, multiplication of x, and the dimension of theta was greater than n squared, so this multiplication a, b, x may be not identifiable. So if theta is greater than n, n squared, then I will have more parameters than would be necessary to define the matrix a, b. And in this case, I would have more parameters than necessary to specify this model. Okay, as a, really to, a fairly similar type of question is how sensitive is my model to errors? So let's consider that there's some sort of single observation of my data set corrupted by noise, and that noise is, is zero mean. So if we want to think about the true set of parameters in the noise-free condition, it will give me this uh, parameter theta zero. So if we're then to consider the corrupted version, where epsilon i is the noise on the ith data point, then we get this expression here where the error function is a function of the noise as well as the parameter. If I use the fact that the theta zero is the true set of parameters, I know that that's going to be the minimizer of this error function in the zero noise case. And this is going to imply a certain condition of my uh, gradient of this error function. I won't get into the details of how to derive this, but you can use what's known as sensitivity analysis to use that fact and determine the sensitivity of the estimate to the error. And in this case, you can see that there's a term that depends on the Hessian of the error function inverse times the uh, Jacobian times epsilon. So what's important here is to look at this, this Hessian component. In fact, so you can think about this as essentially governing your sensitivity uh, to, your, to your objective function. So your objective function can be thought of locally as a quadratic. And so if your epsilon is nearly flat in a dimension, so that the Hessian is small in some dimension, what this means is that if you change the parameter in a large fashion, then the error doesn't change very much. Correspondingly, if you're to change the, the observation in such a way that it would pull your optimum in, in this direction, it doesn't, change, it doesn't take very much of noise to pull your parameter estimate away from the optimum. So in general, the looking at the diagonal of the Hessian matrix, gives you some sense of how large your errors are going to be. Now, in order to reduce your error, you can either include more observations, or you can come up with a different set of observations or a calibration procedure measurements to reduce the, um, well, to, to increase the, uh, the shape of, your, uh, of this bowl that approximates your optimum. So just in summary of what we talked about today, we talked about calibration being a process of one, building some sort of forward parametric model of our sensor. We then establish some sort of ground truth and an acquisition procedure to produce that uh, observation data set. And then we minimize error over that data set. Specifically, we talked about intrinsic and extrinsic parameter calibration for cameras. And we also discussed the issues of nuisance parameters, identifiability, and sensitivity. That's it for now. I'll see you next time.